Oh, here we go. Hi, this is Manpreet Bundy, and I'm delighted to join you for this virtual OLE conference from Rochester, Minnesota. And my topic today is to discuss home parental nutrition and how um, we can best avoid complications that commonly occur. These are my uh, disclosures. And what I'll be doing is spending the next 20 or 25 minutes discussing some of those common complications that we see uh, as we're managing our patients on home parental nutrition. Uh, what are some of the strategies we use to minimize those complications and where there's innovation or changes that are occurring. And so let's start with uh, our patient. Um, and uh, she is a 42 year old female who unfortunately developed necrotizing pancreatitis followed by ischemic bowel. So there was insufficient blood flow to that bowel that unfortunately resulted in enterocutaneous fistulas developing, um, requiring her to go back to the OR multiple times. And in that process, she unfortunately had a number of bowel resections, um, which then led to significantly shortened bowel. Uh, in the end, she had about 60 centimeters uh, remaining. Uh, on top of this, also developed end-stage renal disease. So now we have two different organ systems that are not functioning uh, well. And then we were asked uh, to then come by, start parental nutrition, um, as well as train her uh, to manage this at home. And again, when we think of this situation, similar to the situation with her kidneys, where we would consider that renal failure, uh, we would take the same approach and consider this as intestinal failure. You know, at this stage, uh, because of how short her bowel is that's remaining, we feel that uh, at this point, most likely she will be unable to meet her nutrition, hydration, and, and perhaps electrolyte needs um, through oral intake or enteral feeds. So we're not able to use her gut. And, you know, for those new to this concept, um, you know, Dr. Peroni uh, and the Home Artificial Nutrition Group uh, from ESPN have done a lot of work uh, in this, and this is one of those publications, uh, really looking at what is the best way to then classify these individuals. One way is to classify them uh, in a functional capacity of really how long is this intestinal failure expected to last, um, with, you know, type one being the short term. Uh, type 2 um, being the prolonged acute condition where um, intestinal failure may last uh, weeks to months. And then really type 3, um, you know, where the situation may be irreversible or last a few months to years. We also then start to classify uh, individuals with intestinal failure uh, based on, well, what was the cause of this intestinal failure? In the case of our patient, you know, we're dealing with short bowel, uh, where she has insufficient length of bowel uh, to again absorb nutrition and hydration. Uh, there could also be an intestinal fistula, especially an enterocutaneous fistula, which again could raise the same situation where there's insufficient bowel to, to where you're able to drink and eat uh, and then have that absorbed to some adequate capacity. Um, there can be dysmotility. So some folks um, you know, have difficulty with oral intake because food uh, or, or fluids are not moving along the intestine in the normal way that they need to. Uh, so along those lines, there can be an obstruction, such as we often see with our patients uh, with cancer. Um, there can also be uh, extensive small bowel mucosal disease as well. And so, um, you know, as we think about these different causes, uh, often we're called upon to then initiate parental nutrition. And this is largely where we start to think about the first complication, um, and, and that is that concept of refeeding. Uh, and this concept, you know, especially the modern term, came about uh, especially during World War II. And this was a time, um, you know, especially in the concentration camps, uh, where uh, soldiers were going in uh, after the concentration camps were liberated. Uh, they were seeing the survivors in, in the state, almost the malnourished state that they were in. And obviously that first human instinct is to then provide them nutrition. 
Uh, and when they did so, unfortunately, many developed significant side effects, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, and some even passed away. And so um, that's when, um, you know, uh, British medical students, nurses, and others uh, got together to try to understand this uh, in greater detail. Um, and now, you know, we feel that the co this concept of refeeding occurs because essentially you are restarting that feeding mechanism, right? The machinery that's required for us to be able to uh, process that food and, and, and derive some energy from it. Uh, and what happens is when we're not eating, uh, we're in a mode of starvation or inadequate nutrition, a lot of that machinery comes to a stop and we start to see changes and shifts in electrolytes that occur in our body. Uh, we also get some deficiencies that occur. And then when we get those things going again, those, those electrolytes can shift pretty rapidly, uh, again, resulting to some pretty severe consequences. So as we've studied this, one of the key findings was that it's very important for us to go very slowly when we refeed uh, individuals who are malnourished for quite some time. And so um, because of you know, the, the work that was done in these concentration camps, this concept of a phased approach to refeeding was derived where really initially we're targeting about 800 calories a day, uh, you know, small amounts to get that machinery going, um, followed by a, a subsequent increase and then a further increase after that. Um, and so because of, you know, the severe consequences, very important for us to identify patients who might be at high risk for developing refeeding uh, and make sure that we proceed very cautiously in those individuals. So the first slide was the NICE criteria, and more recently, uh, Aspen has also published a consensus recommendations uh, regarding refeeding, where they define those individuals with moderate risk having, you know, two of these uh, risk factors or significant risk having one of these risk factors. And you can see, you know, what are the the big components to this are you know, that individual's current weight, uh, as well as the amount of weight that they have lost and uh, the amount of calories they have been taking in. You know, this combined with what do their labs or electrolytes look like to start with uh, can really help you define uh, the, the true risk that these individuals have. And then I'll, I'll go through these slides. I mean, they're there for your reference, but the key is that when we get started, we also follow those same tenets that we learned in World War II, which is to go very slowly in calories, especially dextrose, because dextrose is what then leads to our insulin levels rising, um, you know, our, our uh, machinery uh, in terms of energy processing increasing, uh, and then uh, you know, those electrolyte shifts that we worry about. So we go very cautiously. Um, and, and in those individuals uh, with high risk, especially if they have electrolyte abnormalities to start with, sometimes we even hold nutrition early on until we can correct all of those electrolyte abnormalities, right? And then we slowly increase calories uh, as, as the patient tolerates again, being very mindful to monitor very, very closely. And, you know, we supplement with thiamine. That, that can be another deficiency that can arise. Um, and we try to do this before giving any dextrose uh, and, and give this intravenously. That's another key uh, fact. And then we really follow their electrolytes very closely, especially potassium, magnesium, phosphorus. Make sure that we're repleted before we start and then as we start to increase calories, we again monitor it typically twice a day for the first three days. Um, and sometimes we need to do it more frequently and then replace more frequently as we kind of move forward. So we continue and do this, um, you know, uh, until uh, the patient is, is kind of through the woods, if I can, if I can say that. Um, and, and again, using the, the practitioner judgment is key. 
So once um, you know a patient has been started on parental nutrition, we've gotten approval to proceed with parental nutrition. That's really when uh, the teaching starts on how to minimize complications and how do we manage this parental nutrition safely. At that same time, we're also having discussions about which central catheter should be placed. Um, and uh, again, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I won't be able to cover that topic in this session, uh, but could do so in a future session. But have the discussion of what's the best fit in terms of the catheter that we want to use, uh, and then start to uh, impart upon the patient some of the key factors involved uh, with parental nutrition, including how to care for that catheter, you know, how to use um, their infusion pump, how to connect, disconnect, how to inject the vitamins, and if they need, uh, how to uh, inject insulin into the TPN. But, you know, the education really doesn't stop there. Uh, I think one of the key factors of education is also then following up with the patient once they've been discharged um, and then, you know, trying to, again, correct some of their behaviors in terms of how they're connecting, disconnecting, um, and then monitoring for any signs of complications. And I'll kind of cover those uh, in, in the next few slides, uh, monitoring their labs. And we typically do this initially uh, every week um, and then switch to every other week. And then finally, uh, on a monthly basis after a while, especially if the patient is stable. We also monitor their weight and can make adjustments to their parental nutrition based on their intake output, uh, their body weight, and those labs. And so when we talk about that early period especially, uh, but this can also be at any other time period, um, really dehydration electrolytes are one of the main complications uh, that we're trying to, to prevent. And here I've tried uh, to kind of give you a demonstration of the entire GI tract. You know, the mouth would be here, uh, the esophagus, the stomach, and then the small bowel which typically is about 365 to 600 centimeters in length um, and consists of the duodenum. And I've put the length, the typical length, again, this varies so much by individual, uh, but the typical length of the duodenum, the jejunum ileum, uh, followed by the colon. Um, and then also where we tend to absorb some of our micronutrients, our vitamins, our macronutrients, right? And again, this is very rough, so please don't take it as, as a hard line, uh, but just a range of where things tend to get absorbed. Um, and, and this is that, that concept of, um, you know, the anatomy is so important to us um, because, um, you know, we want to know which segment of the small bowel do we have remaining. Um, the ileum is, is probably the best for us. It, it can adapt uh, quite a bit and absorb a great deal of uh, nutrients and, and sort of clean things up. Um, so if we have jejunum with some ileum uh, remaining, you know, that's even greater news. Um, but then if we have colon as well as some ileum and some jejunum, that's probably the best news we have. Um, that gives us the best chance at adaptation occurring. Um, and that's because the colon tends to reabsorb a lot of our water, a lot of our salt and other electrolytes. But then more importantly, the colonic bacteria can also take some of those uh, undigested food and really convert them into nutrients that we can then absorb, such as these short chain fatty acids like butyrate. And so by doing so, we can sometimes get 500 plus calories that are just absorbed in this mechanism alone. So that can go a long way um, to having someone become independent of TPN. But the key here to preventing this complication really falls on you, um, the consumer, and that's monitoring intake and output. This is very tedious. It's a pain to do but it's so key for us to make sure that we're meeting those hydration, electrolyte, and nutrition needs. You know, once we have that information, we then try and minimize this complication from occurring 
through dietary modification. That's one of the keys. And the general concept is, you know, if we have short bowel as an example, you have less area to absorb nutrients in. So we want to provide the gut with less amounts of food at any given time. So we switch to these smaller meals, more frequent uh, throughout the day. You know, we also then focus on, well, what are you eating, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're having more complex carbohydrates, avoiding the simple sugars, the sugar alcohols. All of these are then going to, you know, cause more diarrhea, more output. Uh, protein, we also focus on fats and, and trying to maximize, you know, uh, consumption of essential fatty acids uh, as much as tolerated so we don't have essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, you know, we also worry about oxalate, right? In this situation, uh, many individuals, and we see this commonly with bariatric surgery as well, um, that they can de develop calcium oxalate uh, kidney stones. And so we try and prevent this with oxalate, uh, limiting oxalate intake, but also um, using some calcium with the meals. So you form the stones in the gut and, and, and poop them out essentially instead of at the level of the kidneys. You know, fiber also uh, becomes important. Uh, then in terms of fluids, this is the second part that I think is just essential. Um, you know, even though um, many folks have cravings, um, but we want to make sure we're still avoiding those refined sugars. You know, sodas, fruit juices, all of this are going to make that output much, much worse and then make it very difficult for us to stay hydrated and also maintain our electrolyte levels. Um, we also use oral rehydration solution. And the core concept here, try to do a pretty bad drawing here, but essentially, uh, what we're trying to use is is transporters that exist, you know, in our GI tract, and and some of these, like the glucose sodium transporter, um, can then you know absorb both of these nutrients, but then bring in water uh, along with it, uh, increasing our absorption. Um, but in order to do this, it, it does need to have higher sodium concentration, and for many, this can be quite salty. Uh, so we try our best, um, you know, to, to, to minimize the, the taste of it. Um, you know, the other part of this, speaking of taste, is that the taste can also become quite tedious. And so it, we've done some work here on modifying some of our recipes with different flavor packs, et cetera, and, and kind of seeing that patients, you know, they, they start to accept the taste of it after a while, uh, especially with these manipulations. Then comes the medications. And here really what we're trying to do is go after some of the mechanisms that could be leading to that malabsorption. So this is again a busy slide, but it's there for your reference. Um, you know, for acid hypersecretion, we have medications that can work to reduce that. Uh, sometimes, especially in our fistula patients where the output is just significant, uh, we can also use somatostatin. And this just generally decreases, you know, secretions. Um, we use it sometimes in terms of our, our hormone output like insulin. Um, so we do have to be careful uh, with its use, but sometimes we don't have any other way to decrease that fistula output. Um, we also then use medications to slow down how quickly the GI tract moves. And many of you may be on these medications, you know, with the first one being loperamide or imodium. Uh, you know, if, if that's insufficient by itself, often we add lamodal. Uh, and then our third one that we add is tincture of opium. Um, in other cases, you know, uh, bile acids may be the culprit and we could see bile acid diarrhea and have to use a binder in those situations to try and minimize this. Uh, and then last but definitely not least are our GLP-2 agonists. And there's a great deal of work being done in this realm as well. Uh, Tadouglutide is uh, currently the FDA approved GLP-2 agonist, uh, but there are a number of other ones uh, that are also being uh, evaluated. And we do have uh, another lecture on this topic. So I'll, I'll just uh, skip you know, further discussion uh, for now. 
So we use those um, strategies to try and minimize dehydration and uh, electrolyte uh, um, abnormalities from occurring. Another complication that we worry about uh, is catheter-related bloodstream uh, infections. And this can be quite serious, obviously, because the tip of your catheter uh, is you know, right there at the level of the heart or just above. Um, and so this infection can get uh, you know, bad pretty quickly. Um, and the other part of this is that um, you know, the, the catheter is all almost, uh, I'm sorry, the catheter is also uh, very frequently removed as well uh, when, when folks go and uh, become evaluated for this. Um, and so here's some of our experience uh, that we've published uh, looking at what are the causes, you know, what are the typical bacteria and other causes of these infections. And this, this is sort of the frequency that we see uh, in our practice. Uh, but as I was mentioning, you know, it's, it's so key for us uh, to prevent the catheter from being pulled if we can avoid it. And that concept is called catheter salvage. Uh, and we want to do this because the more frequently you have these catheter pulled, uh, sometimes you can lose access to that site. And for many of our patients, um, you know, parenteral nutrition um, is necessary for them to get any nutrition or hydration. And so essentially it's, it's you know, prolonging their life. And, and so if you lose access to the site, this can become a very dire situation. Um, and so we try our best, obviously in certain situations, you know, where there's sepsis or septic shock where you're in the ICU, um, you know, and you're not hemodynamically stable, we don't have a choice and, and we may have to remove the catheter. Uh, others where there's bacteria that are very resistant uh, to salvage, um, you know, we may have to uh, do the same thing. But in many cases, we are able to salvage the catheter. We wanna infuse those antibiotics directly through the infected catheter uh, treat for 10 to 14 days, reculture at the end of treatment, make sure it's cleared, um, you know, before we um, uh, move forward. And here's, uh, you know, our experience with the catheter salvage. And you can see that it, for many bacteria, we have a very good shot of, of salvaging that catheter and not needing removal. Whereas for others, you know, it's, it's much more difficult um, to do so. Uh, this is experience from uh, Simon Law and the UK group uh, in Manchester. Um, you know, their um, rate of, of catheter uh, uh, bloodstream infection, catheter-related bloodstream infection was, was quite low as well. So they have around 0.4 infections per thousand catheter days. Uh, our group, when we've looked at this year to year, has kind of varied between 0.4 and 0.6. Um, per thousand catheter days. Uh, so very similar uh, to Simon's group. Uh, and again, uh, most infections they found were single organisms and they could also quite successfully salvage the vast majority of these infections. And that's really key, very important for us. Um, you know, another way that we wanna make sure that uh, we don't lose catheters is when they get damaged. So this is another, you know, complication that can arise. Um, and uh, this is a typical call we may receive, uh, you know, where we have a, a, a husband of a patient uh, calling us and saying, uh, you know, that uh, it was difficult to flush the catheter, um, you know, pushed, uh, and then um, the catheter sprung a leak. Uh, in many cases, you know, if, if uh, the resources aren't available, this individual would, would go in, the catheter would be removed. Uh, and then a new catheter would be placed. Again, placing them at risk for uh, losing that site. So uh, many groups uh, have shown that, especially with Hickman catheters, they can be readily uh, repaired. These are some of our pictures uh, showing that repair process. Um, you know, we've published our experience uh, with a step-by-step -step, uh, kind of picture approach. Uh, and again, showing why we do this. Uh, you know, if we lose those sites, we're often resorting to extremes, uh, such as using a lumbar, uh, translumbar approach uh, to trying to get access. Um, and, and again, that can have complications of its own. So 
you know, whatever we can do to try and, and salvage the catheters, um, you know, we want to do. And so this is just from that same uh, experience we had where we looked at over 55 catheters that were repaired. Um, and we were, you know, concerned about, you know, is there higher risk of, of infection after we repair a catheter? And we saw that just was not the case. Um, there was not an increased risk. And this is the key right here in that, you know, um, the catheter duration. So the individuals had had uh, the catheter in place before they needed uh, a, a repair for about 900 days, the median. This was the range. And then once the catheter was repaired, you can see that at the time we finished the analysis, um, 685 days. So we almost doubled uh, the duration of that catheter staying in place uh, by doing this repair, which is just incredible. Okay, um, so sake of time, I'll, I'll kind of switch uh, to the liver here. And one other complication, you know, that we talk about quite a bit, and we'll have another lecture as well um, on this topic is intestinal failure associated liver disease, right? And this is actually, unfortunately, quite common. Um, you know, a number of reasons why you can have this. A um, lot of work being done on all of the reasons. You know, a lot of work being done on choline deficiency. Um, you know, a lot of work has been done on lipids and their contribution to this. Um, this slide kind of just shows you how much lipid emulsions have evolved. And uh, I'm just so excited by the number of options we now have available in the U.S. Uh, for lipid emulsions, you know, uh, olive oil, soybean oil. We've got all these mixed oil uh, approaches, uh, fish oil containing, and even 100% fish oil. And I'll kind of cover our experience with this briefly, again, noting that you've had another lecture on this, uh, but, you know, just showing you all of the different options we have available. So our experience really started when mixed oil ILE became available. And prior to this, um, you know, we were predominantly using 100% soybean oil um, for our lipid emulsion. And many times when, you know, the liver numbers would rise, we would start to decrease uh, the number of days that individuals received that 100% soybean oil. We wanted to make sure they were getting enough at least to not develop essential fatty acid deficiency, uh, but they're not getting too much to kind of further um, cause issues with the liver. Uh, but when mixed oil uh, uh, ILE became available, we then started to switch our patients uh, who had issues with 100% soybean oil to that mixed oil. And this was an experience. This has been a while since uh, you know we looked at, at this data. Um, but at the time we did the analysis, you can see that almost 17 of those individuals out of the 64 that had transitioned, um, you know, had been on uh, mixed oil ILE for at least a year. And uh, out of those that didn't complete, the, the majority were still uh, on mixed oil. They just hadn't, hadn't reached that one, uh, that 12 month mark. Uh, some had actually expired and, and uh, most of these individuals, you know, had succumbed to their disease such as cancer. Uh, many had been weaned off of parental nutrition as well. So this is kind of the baseline. And you can see, you know, at the time we analyzed over 580 days uh, on average uh, of uh, use of mixed oil. So we had quite a bit of experience and uh, I'll kind of go through this quickly. Uh, but essentially what we saw uh, was that we were able to dramatically decrease the amount of dextrose calories that we were giving, increase the amount of lipid calories that we were giving while the liver numbers actually improved. So that was that was really key uh, for this. And there, these are kind of plots showing you similar data. Uh, you can see, especially with the bilirubin, um, that when this transition is made, there's this dramatic improvement in bilirubin, um, you know, that, that occurs. Um, and this is just kind of showing you those macronutrients where we're able to increase the amount of lipids that we're giving uh, and, and decrease the amount of dextrose. Uh, so, you know, however, with our experience, we've noted 
uh, that, um, you know, in, in some cases, fortunately, this is quite rare, but in some cases, um, you know, they tend to be uh, that that strategy of switching to mixed oil ILE is not fully successful. Um, and we've started considering these as mixed oil ILE refractory IFELD. Um, and uh, share with you some of our experience in this situation. Um, these are our first two patients, um, you know, and for the sake of time, I won't go through it in detail uh, with the case, uh, but our first patient, um, you know, that had mixed uh, oil ILE refractory IFAL um, was a 40 year old uh, individual female um, on parental nutrition since 2015 in the setting of chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction. So kind of in that dysmotility uh, camp and came to us for evaluation uh, for IFALD in 2019. Um, you know, and, and you can see some of her symptoms. Um, and the, the main thing was that she had gone through multiple trips to the OR and in the end had about 25 centimeters of jejunum remaining, right? So in this situation, uh, if we're not able to reverse or manage this eye felt, we're really looking at a small bowel transplant. So when we evaluated her, um, you know, this was her, her HPN formula. Uh, you can see these are the number of calories she's receiving. And she was on mixed oil ILE, 100 grams, two days per week, which amounted to 0.49 grams per kilogram per day. We did an MRI, uh, lastography, uh, so this could allow us to look at the fibrosis, the stiffness level, you know, in the liver, and she was at the stage one, two. Uh, she also had steatosis, fatty liver, right, 19% fat fraction. Uh, and so we looked at this, we reviewed the literature, and a lot of the literature, as you've heard, um, you know, really has been in the pediatric population. And that's where using 100% fish oil uh, has been extremely successful. Uh, we also looked at case reports, you know, in literature uh, and noted that really many were targeting about 0.2 grams per kilogram per day uh, at a minimum of fish oil, of 100% fish oil. Uh, and so in this individual, what we did was we used that combination approach to try and reach that target of 0.2 um, at least. And so what we did was we used 50 grams of, of mixed oil four days per week. And then we used 50 grams of 100% fish oil three days per week. So we used this kind of alternating approach um, and monitored very closely liver numbers um, as well as a follow-up MRI. And what we saw was that this approach allowed us to then increase the amount of uh, fats that we were giving, amount of lipid emulsion that we were giving and achieve that decrease in dextrose that we want, um, you know. And this was occurring while the liver numbers were improving. And, and what was probably surprising to all of us was that when we repeated that MR elastography, we saw that there was resolution in that steatosis, that liver fat, and that the liver stiffness had now come back to a normal range. And this occurred while there was no signs of essential fatty acid deficiency, right? The triene tetraene ratio actually improved. Our second case uh, was a gentleman, um, you, you know, with necrotizing pancreatitis complicated by intra-abdominal abscess and enterocutaneous fistula. Started on parenteral nutrition with the hope of optimizing nutritionally and then being able to um, come back for uh, fistula takedown and hopefully transition to oral intake. But unfortunately, uh, with parenteral nutrition, started developing liver function abnormalities. Uh, we again transitioned to mixed oil, but this was unsuccessful. And you can see the ebbs and flows in terms of what we then tried to do almost over the next few years. You know, each time the liver numbers would increase, we would hold the parental nutrition, uh, but he would become malnourished, lose weight, and we would have to restart again. Then we would start to see that rise 
in liver numbers again. So this kind of just continued until we were able to then transition to uh, fish oil uh, containing lipid emulsion. And in this situation, because of the extreme reaction he had had to uh, mixed oil ILE in terms of the liver, we switched to 100% fish oil, so completely. And you can see after that, we were able to actually continue um, you know, with parental nutrition with success and transition him, uh, I'm sorry, take him back to the OR uh, for that fistula takedown. So this was also just a tremendous success. And in this plot, you can see what would happen in terms of his liver numbers, um, where each time we restarted, those liver numbers would rise quite quickly. And those are the spikes that you're seeing. Um, and once we started that 100% fish oil, you could see those numbers going down and, and the success of him going you know, back to the OR. So, um, and again, all this occurred without the development of essential fatty acid deficiency. So with that, I've gone a bit over time, but wanted to cover uh, a lot of the main complications that we see. Obviously I could not cover all of them uh, and there's a lot of detail and nuances um, where you do need to work with your, your team uh, to try to get to the bottom of, of issues you may be having, uh, but I'm hoping that was a useful overview and look forward to uh, the question and answer session. So thank you.